Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, Texas Tech University Library's um, Zoom event uh, for Her Story 2. Um, and we want to welcome uh, Dr. Chang C. Chen, who is with us today. Uh, Dr. Chang C. Chen moved from the US uh, to the US from Taiwan in the 1970s. She earned her PhD in biochemistry from Rutgers University and Juris Doctor from Columbia University. She has authored over 80 books. Dr. Chen's most recent works include Her Story 1 and 2, The Legal History of Chinese American Women, published in 2016 and 2021, respectively. These books document Chinese American women who had fought for their equal rights through legal proceedings, which rewrites American history. From these works, she has curated an exhibit with the same titles. The exhibit showcases Chinese American women who had filed lawsuits fighting for remedies for discrimination equal opportunities for education and voting rights starting in 1848. Many of these legal fights became landmark cases to benefit not only Chinese Americans, but all Americans. This exhibit has traveled all around the US from now uh, with no end in sight yet. Um, the last her story exhibit starting in 2015 to 2019. Those of you in California and Texas can view the exhibit at the Chinese Center of San Francisco Main Library and at Texas Tech University Library's Crossin Room in Lubbock, Texas. Um, and she recently has another one up and she'll talk about it soon. It will be on display um, in also in New York Public Library, Chatham Square Branch starting July, UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library and Los Angeles, Los Angeles Central Library in 2013. More exhibits are, are in the planning. So Dr. Uh, Chen, would you, Oh, I'm sorry. And um, this is on the part of uh, myself, Esther De Leon. I am the uh, librarian for Media and Communications, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, um, and Jing Jing Wu, who is uh, the web librarian here at Texas Tech University. Um, and Dr. Chen, uh, you can, if you would like to start, um, and okay. Jing Jing will uh, share her screen. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, I started this project in 2015 because I want to help my friend who is also a, who is an immigration lawyer um, and he told me he doesn't have any cases. So I say, okay, I can write for you in the Chinese newspaper and maybe people will come to you for uh, you to help them with their immigration cases. Anyway, so I wrote the first story. I never know. The first story was happened in 1844, where 22 Chinese women came from Hong Kong, was labeled as um, lewd, as prostitute. Um, yes, this 1874, and uh, they were set to be deported. Somehow people find money to pay for the legal fees. So they fought their case. And the first case was in San Francisco District Court. They lost because um, one of the white witness said that all Chinese lewd women wear colorful um, belly benders, you know, like uh, here. And uh, so uh, because they wear loose clothes with very big sleeves, at that time, the bigger the sleeves, it shows that you have more money. So um, the judge ordered the lawyer to look into uh, their sleeves. And sure enough, all 22 had colorful bare belly benders. <laughs> so the judge say, okay, you're all prostitute. Now leave this country. And so they appeal to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court say, I wouldn't give any of those little immigration officer the right to just discriminate and look at one person and say, okay, you are lewd and you are prostitute. No, no, no. Those immigration rights belong to the court, the, the, the Supreme Court. And so the case was reversed and the 22 women stay and where all their offspring, <laughs> I hope not, anyway. So anyway, so they, that's the first case, 1974, and it's called the 22 lewd Chinese women. 
Can you imagine? So after that, I was very inspired. I didn't care about uh, making more cases for my friend. So I went on to do research. And I, the next one I found is with, um, yes, Mamie Tape. She, her family are rich. So um, uh, they want to put her to a nice white school. And the um, principal standing at the door and say, no way, you're Chinese, you don't belong here. So her parents sue. They won because, you know, like constitution say you cannot discriminate. However, um, so they are set to join the San Francisco public school the next day. And San Francisco legislature passed a bill overnight to set up a oriental school just for Chinese kids and other Asians. So Mamie Tape attended the oriental school. So was her brother. Can you show the next slide? Um, uh, no, okay, no, I didn't put it. It's still in San Francisco today on Sacramento Street. It's called Gordon Lau School. The name has changed. Before it's called Oriental, but now it's called Gordon Lau Elementary School. So um, this is Mamie Tape. So the case go on and on and I, I become like fiercely <laughs> involved in it. So I wrote the first her story and I wrote a book. I know that nobody will buy it. So I bought 300 copy myself and I sent it to all my friends. And one of my friends happened to be National Taiwan History Museum director. So he said, okay, I want you to curate and exhi exhibit. I'm women only, okay? I don't want men's, but only Chinese women. So um, I curated the exhibition. I even was able to raise fund um, over $100,000 to build a nine square feet mirror maze in wrong shape. It was so beautiful. It was embedded in thousands and thousands of LED, LED lights over. And like when the exhibition opened, I had screaming little kids running all over because on top of the LED lights are like um, glass sand. Uh, you, you can't just buy it anywhere. I have to special order it. I bought three, uh, five tons of glass sand and the LED lights are underneath it. Can you imagine all mirror? So it's like heaven on earth and beautiful, beautiful. And the next day, five pounds, uh, five tons of sand become three tons because all the kids brought a little with them. Anyway, it was a great exhibition. It was um, extended for four months, you know, like originally it was only one and a half month and it become four months. So I was very proud. I, I want to bring that glass uh, mirror maze into the US. I talked to San Francisco Public Library. They say, no, 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 we cannot have that. I say, why not? It's beautiful, it's an art. They say, no, because we have a population, it's called the homeless population. They will find it a heaven and they will go in and do parts. And then we need to have all the security to pull them out. And in the process, they may get hurt and then we'll be sued. So no mere maze. So all you can see now, is this, okay? Before we have 20 pieces of original art, just as beautiful as it can be. But now we can only settle for the, um, the pictures, but I'm still very grateful for this opportunity that Texas Tech uh, offered me because I, I want to tell the story because Chinese American women, Asian American women are so good. I think this world will belong to them. Look at the president of Sweden, the president of Finland, they're all women. So women's time is coming. So I'm glad we are celebrating the Women's Month in May. The next slide, please. This is Mabel Lee. Uh, if you go to New York in Chinatown, you'll see a post office with Mabel Lee's name tag on it. It's Mabel Lee Memorial Office because she came to the States very early and she was attending Columbia University. She realized that women cannot vote. So she organized a protest where she rode on white horse and there were a thousand followers. They march on the street fighting for asking for women's suffrage. Anyway, they got it. 
The woman got it in 1920, but however, she couldn't vote still because there was um, Chinese exclusion law. So she didn't even vote until after 1940. So uh, to uh, member to um, honor her memory, uh, the New York uh, the New York Post Office has this plaque called the Mabel Lee Post Office. Next slide, please. Okay, I don't know whether you know her, but in California, all the businessmen know her because she's the one that signs our business license. Her name was March Fang Yu. Uh, Yu was her husband's last name. Fang was her maiden name. And uh, she got it, she made it when she found out that the public toilet, the main, man's public toilet is free, was free, but women's public toilet, you have to pay two cents. So um, she did a dramatic show. She smashed a toilet in the state building and that sent her to the political office for the next 29 years. <laughs> she passed away at age of 85, not so long ago. But the building was also, uh, the state building was also named March Fang Yu State Building. I bet you don't know about it, huh? Okay, next one, next slide, please. Okay, um, this woman, uh, her name is Mi Chu. Uh, she graduated from Harvard, had a PhD from Harvard in library science. And she tried to get a job. They told her that uh, there's an opening in the um, Asian uh, section. So she applied for it. She didn't even get an interview. Um, so she was very confident, you know, coming from a very prestigious family and going to Harvard and all that. So she just sued, say that that job belonged to me. And upon examination, they found out that the Library of Congress hired a man uh, who's Korean uh, descent and uh, who didn't have PhD or professorship or didn't speak third language, although that those were the requirement for the job. So the judge offered Mi Chu the job and she stayed there for 35 years until like three years ago, she retired. Okay, next one. Um, this is uh, uh, Helen. Helen Liu um, married uh, Henry Liu. Uh, Henry Liu is, was a writer who writes to criticize the Jiang Qingguo regime, uh, who was the president of, Jiang Qingguo was the president of Taiwan. And uh, he wrote the articles here to be distributed among the Chinese community here in the States. Still, Jiang Qingguo over there was angry. So they sent a killer to come to Daly City where he and his wife resides to kill him. His wife was upstairs. She heard gunshot and thought, what was going on? She went down and saw her husband already covered in blood and they called the police and the police was very smart. They say, oh, we saw three abandoned bicycles on the corner. So that must belong to the killer. So they took the bicycle and they found fingerprint. Anyway, they just show you how low tech at that time, 1989 and um, the first trial in San Francisco District Court, uh, Helen lost the case because they say, uh, we can't sue Taiwan government. Yeah, Helen sued Taiwan government. We can't sue the government because of state action. We cannot second guess the state action. Luckily, Helen Liu has a group of loyal friends and they help her appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court and she won. Uh, in the circuit court, they say, they opined, that um, state action does not cover when a foreign killer came to the U.S. soil to murder a U.S. citizen. State action does not cover that. You know, this case set a very important precedent for Khashoggi's case. So Khashoggi, you know, right? He, he was a prominent journalist who report on all the bad things. Anyway, the royal family, lure her, him into, I think it was the embassy of Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Anyway, they murder him right there. 
because of this president that you cannot murder a for U.S. citizen on U.S. soil. So they murdered Khashoggi in foreign soil in the embassy. So this is the precedent of Khashoggi's case. Very sad to say. Okay, next, please. Okay, this is uh, Dr. Wang Shu Ping. Um, she was a doctor and was very, very, um, uh, she blew the whistle on the Chinese government. She said all the needle you use to transfer blood uh, and to draw blood from blood donors um, were not examined, were not screened. And they had um, AIDS virus and hepatitis virus. So she offered to pay for all the examinations. She offered, she said, I'll set up a clinic. Everybody come here will be free. Of course, uh, the bureaucracy did not like that because it showed how incompetent they were. And there was a epidemic in China with all the AIDS patients at the poorest countryside because they don't have money to do the screening. Anyway, uh, Dr. Wang was soon um, in danger, he was in danger. And an American journalist helped her to escape. So she came to the US and she stayed in Utah. She was still relentless. She wrote a show about what happened in China about the AIDS. So, um, but anyway, she lived in Utah, she remarried. And uh, oh, her first husband divorced her because of this. And so she remarried and was happy. But uh, two years ago, she died suddenly in Utah when they were going on a hike. So I guess, um, okay, so I don't, I cannot second guess that if she was, she died in a mountain hike. So maybe it's from natural cause. She died at age of 59. Okay, next case. And this is Sherry Chen. I'm sure you all heard of the thousand of Chinese recruit a thousand scientists and cooperate on science project. But anyway, um, Sherry Chen was um, reported by her colleague as being a Chinese spy, although she was uh, exonerated. She was not a Chinese spy, but she still lost her job and she sued. And in the meantime, the whistleblower on her case got promoted to become her boss. So she, there's a no winning case. She won and the US government appeal. And the, uh, uh, all the appeal cases take six years to be heard. So during these six years, can you imagine how Sherry Chen suffer? So she, she lived by herself now. Her husband just passed away. Uh, luckily, she still got salaries, but no job back. So we'll have to wait a few more years for her case to be heard uh, by the appellate court. I'm sure she will win. They just want to make her suffer. So she's now alone in Ohio. Okay, so the next, we can win all the time. So next case. Her name is uh, Chanel Miller. Her mother is Chinese and she grew up in Silicon Valley. And uh, one night she joined a party, a crazy party at Stanford. And when two graduate students found her, she was behind a, a garbage dump and a broke Turner, a Stanford student was on top of her. Uh, she was raped anyway, so she, went home, didn't tell her parents anything for two months until she almost got a nervous breakdown. So she told her parents, her parents were shocked. So they put her through therapy and then she finally decided to come out. So she told everybody what happened. The prosecutor was involved and um, Brooke Turner was um, convicted on three sex assault charges. And the judge, this judge, think that, thought that, wow, Brooke Turner was a uh, amazing swim, swimmer. He was the star of the swimming team at Stanford. So the judge was a swimming in the swimming team as well. So he sentenced him on three sex assault charges for six months only. So this news 
make the public angry. So um, a Stanford professor, a woman professor, um, start a campaign to record Judge Persky. Amazingly, in six months, they got more votes than they need. They got over 61% of votes to record Judge Persky. Persky became the first judge in California for 76 years to be the first judge to be recalled. And um, Brooke Turner was ordered by Stanford to never return to the campus. And US Olympic team, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Federation announced that he will never be able to join the Olympic again. So the father was angry. His father was angry. Why you ruined my son's life? It was only for 10 minutes. <laughs> so now you know, you know, you can't, you can't reason with them. They just have their own way of thinking. But California passed two laws um, because of this case. Before, uh, two laws. The first law was saying that if you are uh, guilty on sex assault, you can never be paroled and you must sentence no less than three years. That's the first thought of change. The second law is rape now, including digital penetration, any kind of penetration besides penal. So um, this is Chanel Miller. Then she become a well-known writer, colonist, uh, and she's on her way to become a well-known artist. Uh, in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, there is a war mural. Uh, she did that. It's like a permanent collection. So if you go to San Francisco Asian Art Museum, you can see it. Okay. Um, I, I want to show you another picture, but I'm not sure I have it. Um, before, when I wrote Her Story One, I can only find three Asian, Chinese women who become mayors, Congresswoman uh, and um, a judge, a traffic court judge. This time, only six years later, when I do her story two, we have 12 uh, politicians from all levels, and we have so many judges, I lost count. Okay, so we have um, levels in every, every county, every city, and two Congresswomen now. So I have to say, we are, our voice are being heard. And this exhibition uh, will show more people what happened in Asian American women, women, women. So we have the power and I want to show it. So I hope your library will exhibit. And I thank Esther and Jing Jing to help me put this up for exhibition in Texas Tact. Um, I want to show it all over the world to show them that we can do it. Damn it, we can do it. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jing Jing. <laughs> okay, um, let me see. Okay. All right, does anybody have any questions? You can type if you in. have any questions, you can type in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask. If not, I may ask our first question. So Dr. Chen, you spent most of your personal time collecting these stories and keep doing that for years. What inspired you to write these books and other books about Chinese American women? Well, I think most of the amazingly inspiring stories are buried in history. You know, so many things happen. Can you imagine a brave Chinese woman who was 72 years old was beaten up uh, in Oakland like a few months ago and she was so brave she picked a stick and beat the white guys <laughs> to bleeding and so she was still standing there with all her eyes swollen all those beautiful and then 
the community, you know, the GoFundMe collect over a million dollars for her medical treatment. And every donation was $5, $10, all those impact, inspiring story. If nobody writes it up, it will be buried in the sand of history. So I think Chinese Americans in the US, Asian American in the US, we come from a long history of discrimination. Uh, although discrimination is a fact of life, it's human nature, but still we can control it to a uh, permissible level, not to shoot people, no violence, but we know and we have to do a choice ourselves that we will suppress the unfairness of it and we will deal with another person. It doesn't matter, poor, homeless, sick, old, poor, whatever, and to a civilized level because we are human beings in 21st century. What do you expect? So I keep writing as much as I can because I'm used to draft legal opinions for my client, but that's only for one person, one company. And by doing this exhibition, I can help. I can influence a lot of people. And it proves that many people, like when they saw all those cases, they were like, what? Is this true? Is this true? <laughs> of course. And so I think I just want to help. I use, I want to use the rest of my life, uh, I'm already 72, and I want to use the rest of my life for good cause. Thank you, yeah, thank you for your work. Uh, another question is, is there any plan to make this exhibit online? Yeah, it's uh, online, it's called, uh, it's Her Story Law, herstorylaw.org. Okay, we have a comment. It says, I just want to say thank you with your presentation. I find our library actually has the book of Chanel Miller. We have lots of inspiring stories to bring lots of awareness among us and our readers. Oh, and by the way, we did a uh, request um, from Dr. Chen and from the library to purchase us some books or to receive some books. And so we'll have them whenever they get here and we'll get them cataloged so everybody can view them. Um, so, Dr. Chen, what is the most memorable lawsuit that you have documented? I think it was the first one. <laughs> it was the, the story of 22 lewd Chinese women, okay? Many people ask me, were they really prostitutes? You know, how could you see 22, 18 years old, 17 years old uh, women um, coming to the U.S. on their own? So they must be really prostitutes. Well, my, I don't know. What do you think, Esther? You think they were prostitutes most likely? No, and that's because I, and most of you who know me know that I watch a bunch of K-dramas and Chinese dramas. So a lot of those are historical. And so I kind of know, because you base them off something. So I kind of know that, and you know, that there's, what is it called? Um, people who bring other people just it's like in our history oh, snake snake head that yeah or you know it's in our history it's on all of u.s history that you know you bring somebody from another oh country. human trafficking yeah and you bring somebody from another country and you make them do work and and you know that's it's just it happens it's and it's still happening so i think it's um i i believe that they were not prostitutes when they first got here um I mean, it could have been, but I doubt 22 altogether were, you know, right, positive. right. Yeah. Well, it's uh, very interesting because um, I check up their names and basically they don't have names because um, they were so scared. Can you imagine like a fragile little Asian flowers <laughs> and being questioned by a big white Im immigration officer? What's your name? So all of the names are like, and, and she was like, ah. Oh. So her friend would say, oh, we call her Afong. We call her Ale. We call her Ame. 
So all 22, mo most of them are Afang, <laughs> and A ah is not a last name. It's just a, uh, you know, <laughs> so it's very interesting. But anyway, and they also question who paid for their legal fees? Who has the far side to, you know, to sue? Um, it didn't happen many. So I think it's very interesting. Uh, those 22 women always appear in my dreams <laughs> because I think... <laughs> Very, very interesting. Jing Jing, do you want to ask the next one? Okay. Uh, so Dr. Chen, you got your master's and doctor's degree in biochemistry, then became a scientist years later, and you became a lawyer. Can you share um, what is inspired you to change careers? Okay. Um, not in another spam, in another Zoom call, people ask me, uh, were you ever being discriminated? And I told her, I am discriminated every day. <laughs> every day. And I discriminate against other people every day too. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, and but when it happened to me, when it's like gross injustice in my hand, in my mind, I cannot tolerate it. Um, when I first got my uh, PhD at Roche, uh, you know, with the help of Roche Pharmaceutical Company, I work at uh, their Institute of Molecular Biology as a scientist. Um, they, uh, I was in the same room with a, a guy, okay? So uh, we are at the same level. And when it's time for promotion, he was promoted and I wasn't. So I asked my boss, I say, hey, I deserve to be promoted. And he said, we only have one position. I said, why can't you promote both of us? Anyway, I was very angry. He said, because he is a man. He has to support his wife and kids. I mean, you have a husband. Go back and have your wife, a husband support you. Wow. How dare he? So I did the mistake. I went to his boss. Like, you never do that. You don't complain to your boss's boss hoping he will overturn the decision of your boss. How would I know? I was only 25 years old. So of course, and then I was doing this and I went to my boss's boss, boss's boss's boss. And like in three days, the union during coffee break, a union worker come to me and go, hey, you better go find yourself a lawyer. You're getting fired, you know, because they work on the, uh, your review. And my review was always excellent. Then you become bad, fair, bad. So they say, you're on your way out. So I went to Newark. They told me you need to find a civil rights lawyer, not just any lawyer, a civil rights lawyer. So in Newark, New Jersey, um, I went into a really dark law office with a big, long oak table in total darkness, only a Lincoln statue, uh, the light shine on the Lincoln statue. It was very dramatic. Anyway, I saw the lawyer behind the huge oak desk. He was an old, short Jewish man. And um, I also saw all the plaque on his wall. He graduated number one from Harvard Law School. So he must be good, right? So on his huge oak table, there was only one decoration, a box of tissue. So I sat across him and he looked at me and he go, now tell me what happened. And I go, I... <laughs> so I start to cry and he pushed that box to me and he said they all do that <laughs> so that's why he had only tissue box on his table so I cry and I, I sob and I try to tell my story and he said okay stop it was only after three minutes he said let me dictate a letter to the president of Roche in Switzerland and you tell me whether it's all correct so he started to dictate 300 words of the most, oh, most beautiful letter I have ever heard. And then his secretary typed it up. That's exactly what I need. So he said, we're going to send this letter to Roche president in Basel, Switzerland. In a week, I was promoted. I can't believe it. So for that 300 words letter, he charged me $700. This is back in 1976. It was very expensive. 
So I say, are you sure you want so much money? He say, you, you will find out it's worth every penny of it. So I was promoted, but I already lost the war. I won the battle, I lost the war. Because from that day on, every time I go into my work, I will be searched. My car will be searched. I will spend an hour just to get into the, the point. Anyway, so I think, so I went to ask my friends, I say, why are we can only eat in the cafeteria while another group of people eat on carpeted room with table covering white cloth and a, you know, a vase with rose. And we are only eating in cafeteria with chef, you know, like, like they could scoop the food into your plate. I say, we are PhDs, we are senior scientists. They say, oh, okay, being a scientist, you're wasting their money. You spend their money in experiments, but they are salesperson and doctors and lawyers. I say, wow, doctors and lawyers? So doctors, lawyers, and salesmen. Indian chief, no. So I choose that I will become a lawyer so I can eat in that cafeteria. Um, and I can help myself when the next discrimination case come. So I applied to Columbia University and uh, I was barely in the country for five years and my English was so bad. The 300 word personal statement is what decides whether you'll get in or not. So I wrote the worst. And the dean of Columbia Law School called me and say, we want to admit Chinese because eventually you'll do something to help sign relationship with the American. But your personal statement is terrible. I can't admit you on that. So can you rewrite it? So how can I rewrite it? So I drove back to that lawyer, that Jewish lawyer, and I say, I need help. And he say, no problem. He wrote another 300 words of the most beautiful <laughs> personal statement. And he said, this will be for free. <laughs> so I got into Columbia Law School. So that's the story. That's very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, I think in the US, uh, the only difference between US and China um, is the law. It's a law that gives you freedom. It's a law that gives you justice. So um, we were asked to study science, engineer, biology, doctor, everything in Asia. They don't want you to get into politics because most of the time you have to pay with your life. Uh, but in the US, you don't have to pay with your life. You just have to pay with your brain by study law to become the best lawyer you can, to help other people find justice, to fight for injustice, and to set precedents for, the, for America. So I think in the US, law is very, very, very important. So I was so surprised when they told me, you're the first one to write the legal history of Chinese American women. So boom, I finally find a niche where it's too small for other people to join my world <laughs> because you had to be Chinese and American and fluent in English, fluent in Chinese and study law and be able to experience enough to write a history. So, so far, I want to find a somebody who uh, can take over when I die. Uh, so if you find something, please, someone who's willing, please, Send them to me. <laughs> hey, Dr. Chen, we have another question. Um, we were interested as a library in the rare photographs in your books. Did you preserve them or are they part of a library's archives or where did you find them? Oh, I, have some, I found some from National Archives in San Bruno and some just from the internet and I talked to them. And if it's for um, charity, for nonprofit, they all give it to you for free. And besides, if you find pictures in China, they don't respect your intellectual property right. And you don't have to respect their property right. So <laughs> you just use it. <laughs> uh, 
oh, and I also got a picture from US Army and it's for free. You know, most of the institution would give you pictures for free. I have a question. Um, if you can hear me, uh, thank you, Dr. Chen, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, you have been dealing with uh, uh, various uh, governments, uh, U.S. government and the Chinese government, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the, uh, the government Taiwan. in Taiwan. So you are doing the sort of transnational work, which is really interesting. So uh, could you tell us the differences in dealing with these different governments uh, yeah. fighting for uh, individuals' rights against these uh, governments, you know, U.S., China, um, you know, and also uh, government in Taiwan? Okay, yeah. um, the government in Taiwan is um, pretty incompetent, okay? Um, they, um, they won't finance the fight unless it's antitrust, unless it's anti, um, antitrust, what's the other one? Anti-dumping. And I was the lawyer for Taiwan government in an anti-dumping case. Basically, we're on our own and their defendants are companies. And it's pretty useless, the Taiwan government, because um, all the defendants are big companies like TMC, like anyway, the chip makers, because there was a price fixing. And um, the US government told the Taiwan government, if you want continue to do business in my country, you want to sell us products, send them to jail, to serve jail in the, in the US government. So the company look at themselves and go, okay, um, the uh, CEO won't go, but the deputy CEO will go. So most of the Taiwan company, uh, when they were doing good, they'll be sued by their peers, by their competitors, and it will be against the government, okay? Because they want to raise ta tariffs. So in my experience, Taiwan is no good. When I deal with China, the Chinese government is pretty scary, okay? Um, uh, uh, my friend was sent to prison. Uh, when I first came out practicing law, uh, she was helping a client doing something. And the government stepped in and go, we think you did not report the true amount of tariffs. So they lock her up for three years. Wow. And then... After three years, they sentenced her for 26 years. Because in China, the sentencing depends on the amount of tax they think you owe. It's not depending on the crime, okay? So they said she owed 200, 20 million, 200 million wow. renminbi, 26 mm -hmm. years. I saw her, she was out. A few months ago, she lost all her teeth. She looked very, very bad. Okay. So after Tian I'm, I had a Beijing law office. I represent 13 international law firms from Finland, from Sweden, from Canada, from everywhere. Okay. Um, I set up a Beijing office. I was very soon uh, called by the public bureau to talk to them and telling me, you are Chinese, you cannot represent Canadian, you cannot represent US. And they changed the law so that we cannot open joint venture law office there. I am not big enough to fight them, okay? So after Tiananmen Square, the massacre, I did not go back to China because I was too scared. Um, so Chinese government, if you don't have to deal with them, please don't, 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 we're too small for that. And the U.S. government is very fine because you can argue, 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 threaten them and everything. <laughs> <laughs> if you can find a reason, you'll win the case. I like U.S. government. I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> Thank you. So Does anybody have any other questions they'd like to ask or comments? Maybe I just have a follow-up question. Uh, Dr. Chen, um, apparently you have done a fantastic job and had a wonderful career. Uh, how would you encourage uh, younger women uh, to assume leadership positions and to be more vocal about their rights? And uh, particularly at this moment, uh, 
uh, of this all these uh, anti um, Chinese anti Asian uh, sentiments around the country, uh, particularly under the uh, Trump administration. You know, so what are the strategies or what are the things that you think? You hit it right on. I'm waiting for this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wrote another serial of books. It's called The Oral History of Chinese American Women <laughs> because we need role models, okay? There was no role models for Chinese women. What they do, they become mother, wife, slaves, you know, like all kinds of things. Um, intelligent, ambitious Chinese woman has role, no role model. I don't have to become a scientist, then become a lawyer, wasting all my times, right? I didn't start to practice until I was 35. Um, I don't think the time, you know, like I spent was time lost. But anyway, I if I would have a role model, I'll be good. So I have set this goal to write at least 100 Chinese American women who are pioneer in their field. They broke the glass ceilings. So, so far I have done 15 of them. You know, it's, it's wonderful. So this, this was the first time I know if you, I want to uh, uh, run for public office, I should study social, uh, to be a social worker first. You know why? Because that's how the first Chinese American woman lawyer of Monterey Park, uh, she, study to be a social worker. So she always ring on people's door like, hey, I'm the social worker. I need to collect information. So when she run for office, she can ring their doorbell. It's not afraid of being shot. <laughs> so she knows everybody. Everybody knows her. She won like the biggest margin because everybody knows her. So do you, would a Chinese young girl know that she should become a social worker first if she wants to run for public offices? Of course, after that, you need much more than being a social worker, uh, but that's a start, okay? And then I don't know what else, um, you know, um, what else you can do, but I would also encourage them to, um, I saw a, a Twitter story. I study, uh, you know, a father say, I study science and uh, physiology and all that. So my, how do I say that? I study science. So my son can study, um, I study mathematics, I study physiology, chemistry, biology. So my son can study law politics and other good stuff who will give them power. So my grandson can study liberal arts, can become a museum guy, can go become an anthropologist. <laughs> so it sacrifices every generation. So I am um, very lucky to be in law and I'm a little bit too old. If I'm not so old, I will run for political offices in, like that, you know? So I admire Biden. I mean, at 72, all my bones ache. I don't know how he can even stand up there, you know? <laughs> so, so yes, I think um, please have your people. Uh, it's all on Amazon. Uh, just type in Chen C. Chen and you'll see all the series on Chinese Ameri the oral history of Chinese American women. I like to donate it, but they're very expensive, you know, because I already wrote 14 of them. If I donate them to you, it will be, yeah, I think I can still afford some, you know, to donate a, a set of the book on Chinese American women, the oral history, how they become who they are, how they fight. It's very important. Thank you. For sure, we can uh, look into requesting them for the library, at least one or two of them. If <laughs> yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll look into that. Um, Thank you, Dr. Chen, for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate you working with us and sending your, us your information and your, your slides and everything. Um, this is our first, or mine and Jingjing's first attempt at, at, at um, you know, celebrating the Asian community um, here on Tech Campus and through the library. And we welcome any collaborations that anybody would like to do. Um, and um, we enjoy having you in this space with us. Um, 
If there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, end for today. And I'd like to thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Oh, 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 can I say one thing more? Yeah. One more, okay. Um, the most recent oral history of Chinese American women are the wife of Li An, the famous oh. director of Li An. Yeah, yeah. Do you know her? Yeah, I, 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 uh, the book will be published very soon. It's called The Wonder Woman Behind An Li, okay? Um, I recorded her, I um, wrote the book, and my decision is I will never marry Li An. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> never, because if he has a job, he will never be home. If he doesn't have a job, he doesn't have any way of feeding himself. <laughs> and then the wife has to make money, feed two kids, take care of two kids, and take care of Leon after he done shooting. He will be totally exhausted. He's schizophrenic. And then uh, she has to take care of him. Okay. So although she tried to be very nice, very polite, but um, you can see all the little complaint, the air of, <laughs> of her horrible <laughs> life seeming through the words, okay? So tell your daughter not to marry people like me. <laughs> well, thank you again. We appreciate you. Well, thank you for organizing this. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.